Chris Bennett received his bachelor's in biology from Haverford College and his medical doctor degree from Stanford University, where he completed postdoctoral training in the lab of Ben Bars. His research focuses on microglia, the brain's resident macrophages. His lab aims to understand how microglial functional states are regulated and how to engineer cellular therapies to replace microglia with therapeutic surrogates. Chris started his research group at the University of Pennsylvania in 2019, and he maintains a clinical practice in psychiatry. Hey, Chris, welcome. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it. Really glad to be here. Um, so let me let me start my timer and while i'm doing that uh i'll say you know it's funny i give talks to large audiences sometimes but this one my mom is at i think so hi hi mom um anyways uh, so i'm going to talk to you about uh, our work trying to design living drugs for the brain and so first i'm going to tell you even what i mean by that and then we're going to go on a bit of a um story through sort of like why I think about these things a lot, where that thought process comes from, and then some of the research that we're doing to try to build these living drugs for the brain. So first, the living drugs that I'm going to be talking about are cells called microglia. And so I'm just going to call attention to this. This is a thin section from a brain of a mouse. So we cut up a very thin slice. And what you can see here using special stains are these cells we're going to, we call microglia. So I'm going to tell you more about them in a second. But I just want you to notice a couple of things. One, they have these very, very fine and to me elegant little cellular processes, we call them these little arms, right? And so what you can see here, here are these blue things, which are the nuclei of cells where there's DNA in them. And some of these cells are microglia, which are the ones in red. And so you see them with these little arms sticking out, right? And the rest of the slide is not empty. It's just we're not visualizing the other cells. So you have to imagine this is a brain, right? It's packed full of other cells. And I think this image gives a real impression of the idea that microglia have these little processes that are in between all these other cells. So what are microglia? Microglia are the brain's resident macrophages. So they're seven to 10% of the total number of cells in the brain. They're long lived and self renew. So they, some microglia in humans, I think live decades. I mean, I think the estimate of some is that some live 20, 20 or 30 years um, and they self renew. So they divide to, and proliferate to maintain their numbers. They have these processes, which I just described to you. And these processes are very dynamic. They're actually, if you look at a video of them in, in mouse models, constantly moving these processes around, kind of scanning the brain to find problems or to perform their functions. And that allows them to be very reactive to changes in the brain. Uh, they perform critical functions. And ironically, I'm not gonna talk to you as much about those, but examples include they use a process called phagocytosis to eat up stuff. So when, when cells die in the brain, microglia often are, are the ones to eat them up to stop there from being dead, dead cells in the brain, for example. And they're very relevant to disease and they're relevant in two ways. In some diseases, microglia get angry or change their state and then contribute to the pathophysiology of a disease. But the other way that they're very relevant is to the potential that they could be used to treat diseases, even diseases with that, that they don't actually cause or that they're not involved in causing. And so that's where I come in here, I suppose. Um, so let me tell you the goals here. I wanna describe this concept of microglia replacement. So the idea that we could introduce therapeutic microglia into the brain as a living drug to replace the microglia that are in there. I'm gonna tell you about some hurdles to actually doing this. And then I'm gonna hope that by the end of the talk, you can even have fun brainstorming applications for microglia replacement therapy. What fun things could we do to these cells to treat diseases? So we'll start with microglia replacement. So what do I mean by this? Again, this is this is here is a, a section of a mouse brain. And instead of it being where we've labeled real microglia with, a, with special stains, like in the previous slide, what we're looking at here is a, a rendering where every microglia is just turned into a little dot. And so what I mean by microglia replacement is imagine that we could get rid of all the host microglia and transplant into the brain donor cells that take their place, right? And it might not be perfect, right? You might not replace all the microglia, but if we could do this and we could do it quickly, efficiently, and it could be specific to microglia and not perturb other cells either in the brain or in other tissues in the body, if we could do that and, and, and use them as an adoptive therapy, so transplant these surrogates in, this would give us a pretty amazing platform on which to then engineer functions into these cells to do all kinds of different things to the brain. 
And since these cells are very long lived, it could offer the potential for a permanent cure to diseases. And this would be different from drugs, right? Where you have to keep giving them. This could be, we, we put these cells into the brain that we engineered to do something we want to treat a disease and then we're done. So that's my sort of my dream. Does that come out of nowhere? No. So why would I think this is even feasible in the first place? So I'm gonna, again, show you this brain rendering here. This is a different angle on the same mouse brain. And again, the dots are individual microglia. And it turns out that if you give mice a small molecule drug, so a, a drug that you put in their food actually, that blocks a certain receptor that's necessary for survival of microglia, you can actually deplete microglia down to very low levels, down to about 2% of their normal numbers. Uh, and the other wild thing that really is what really got me into this field is when you stop giving this medic this medication in the food of these mice, the microglia actually come back very, very quickly. So within seven days, the microglia have repopulated and filled the brain again. And to me, this is a little bit magical. It's sort of how does this happen? And these cells then look, they look normal again. They come back to this really elegant morphology and they're integrated into the into the brain. And so how does this happen? Well, first of all, it sets the stage that, that, that we could get rid of host microglia and maybe replace them. But like, what would that take and how do we build upon this to make that a reality? Um, back to this question, right? How do we do that? So first of all, I just wanna now look at this from a slightly different angle. You know, this, this thing I just pointed out, is this magic? No, not necessarily. And one way to make it clear that it's not magic is to think about microglia in a different way. Unlike most cells in the brain, which you'll hear more about, oligodendrocytes and astrocytes, which come from the same kind of progenitors that also make neurons, microglia actually come as macrophages from the blood system. So they come from blood progenitors. And so just to hone in a little, I think this is where I tried to animate this. Let's see if it works out. Let's do some magic. Let's get rid of the brain. So this was supposed to be a brain. Let's get rid of the brain. Let's get rid of the neural stem cells. Let's get rid of microglia. And let's just focus on this fundamental principle here. Uh, in the blood system, there's a very common theme, which is that blood, blood cell progenitors generate the blood system. And so usually we think about this in terms of the blood system being sort of built intrinsically to expand and contract. And there's these things called blood stem cells, which tend to live in the bone marrow. that can then spawn these progenitors that can then expand and grow to generate things like monocytes, which circulate, and then those can go into tissues and become macrophages, right? And it's not just macrophages, it's all cell types of the blood. So there's a fundamental principle here that blood stem cells can kind of generate the blood system. And the other thing that's about that, which is what we see when we do things like a bone marrow transplant, is that you can actually replace these progenitor cells, right? So you can use things like chemotherapy to get rid of the host stem cells that generate the blood system. And then you can deliver through the circulation into the blood stem cells from a donor that then take the place of these cells and then they generate the entire blood system, right? So when we think about it this way, it's not shocking that microglia as blood cells might be able to expand and contract in this way that I just showed you in that picture. Uh, and that's the idea of a stem cell transplant, which is very common to treat things like leukemias, for example. Uh, okay, so now let's go back to the brain, right? So first of all, macrophages can be replaced, right? I just told you that. And I told you that that can happen in a bone marrow transplant, right? But can microglia, which are macrophages, but they are a very particular kind of macrophages that live in the brain, can they be replaced? And so a way to think about that is, does this thing I just described to you, a bone marrow transplant, does that actually replace microglia? And if it does, is that something that one has, can use for a treatment, right? Um, so the short answer to the first question, do stem cell transplants replace microglia? As we've learned from using mostly animal models, but also in human, that yes, they can, but only if you do things like irradiate the head, which you don't necessarily want to do if you're treating a disease. But what I mean by that is, here's an example of a mouse that received a stem cell transplant where their head was shielded when irradiation was given, which irradiation instead of chemotherapy, but it's the same idea, a preconditioning step to get rid of the host stem cells. If you cover the head, you don't really get many donor cells, which here are green. If you irradiate the head when you give the stem cell transplant, you fill the brain with these cells that come, macrophages that come from the stem cell, right? And you can see that here, the percent of cells that are, pop, that are from the donor are very high, right? So the answer is yes, they can. If you irradiate the head, we may not really wanna do that, right? Um, and the other wrinkle here that I wanna come back to this slide, but I changed the title, is unlike in this case where we're deriving these macrophages in the brain from a stem cell, Microglia normally, like in this model I showed you where we can deplete and then repopulate the brain with microglia, those microglia actually are 
from themselves. They actually divide and repopulate themselves. They don't come from a stem cell, right? So back to second goal of my talk, some hurdles to microglia replacement. Although there's some precedent in the, in the realm of bone marrow transplants where you can replace blood cells with stem cell derived surrogates, it's not that simple with microglia and there's some reasons, right? How do you get cells into the brain that could replace microglia? Uh, it's more complicated than giving chemotherapy and letting them fill the bone marrow and then fill the blood. Uh, and also, if we were to do that, we wouldn't be replacing microglia with the same kind of cell. Microglia can self repopulate and they actually arise during very early embryonic development, not from hematopoietic stem cells, but from some other blood cells that are present before uh, hematopoietic stem cells are present, right? So there's two hurdles here that I wanted to underscore. How do you get cells into the brain and how do you figure out what the right cell is to put there if you're going to try to create this cell based therapy, right? Okay, so those are some hurdles. Uh, so concept of microglia replacement, hopefully hopefully that came across. Uh, hurdles to microglia replacement, hopefully that came across. Uh, oh yeah, I'm not done with hurdles exactly. So second question on that, that slide I showed you. So we answered the do stem cell transplants replace microglia question. The answer is kind of. Uh, do stem cell transplants treat brain disease? And so even though not many cells get into the brain, as I showed you, unless you irradiate the head, and in humans you don't typically do that, even though not many cells get in, there's actually some very interesting precedent for using a bone marrow transplant therapeutically to replace microglia and actually treat a disease. Uh, and that disease is Crabbe disease. This is a disease uh, caused by a missing enzyme called GAL-C that leads to the acute, when the enzyme is not present, certain toxins basically that are, that are lipids, fats accumulate in the brain. And in its inf infantile form, this disease is fatal very rapidly. It takes about 14 months, but most, most unfortunately infants succumb to this disease very rapidly. And this is just an example of what a normal brain looks like in an MRI. And what you can see here is the brain is smaller. You can see these little gyri are much bigger, right? The brain has sort of degenerated. And also these arrows are pointing to damaged oligodendrocytes actually, which Jen is gonna talk about. So this is a really tough disease. And actually the only treatment there is right now is a bone marrow transplant. So that thing I told you about where you peripherally inject into the venous circulation uh, stem cells. And so it turns out that if you give a bone marrow transplant here, it's an HCT on this slide, you can actually prolong survival for decades in, 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 these, uh, in these kids, but you have to give the bone marrow transplant right at birth. If you miss this key window to give it before symptoms uh, arise, it doesn't really work as well. So this graph is showing on the Y axis survival, right? So if you give the bone marrow transplant early, you, there's decent outcomes. If you don't give it, it's rapidly fatal in between is if you give it when symptoms have already arisen. And, and the point here though, is this is thought to work by microglia replacement, even though it's not perfect using a bone marrow transplant. And even though the cells are not microglia, it does something, right? So I think that's pretty remarkable, right? Despite these hurdles I described to you, a bone marrow transplant actually still can treat a brain disease already in humans, right? And so what we wanna do then is innovate on this. And we wanna try to do it in a way that's more specific and more efficient and safer, right? And so the way we've started to approach that problem, let me just check out my clock. Yep, okay, is that we've created models to do this in, in mice where we can actually directly get rid of and replace microglia by directly injecting these surrogates into the brain. And so this is just an example of that. This is one of my postdocs, Carly O'Brien, who pioneered this system. And so what we make use of is a certain genetic model in mouse where we're able to conditionally, what I mean by that is when we deliver a certain drug, when we deliver this drug, we can delete that same receptor, CSF1R, that depletes microglia when you block it, right? So we can deplete, we can get rid of this receptor when we give tamoxifen, and we can do that very early in life, about day one and two after a mouse is born. We can deplete microglia. And then at day three, we can directly inject. So instead of a stem cell having to get from the blood into the brain or a, or a progeny of a stem cell, we can directly inject cells that replace microglia into the brain. And then we can see, did we do a good job? Did we efficiently and safely replace microglia? And the answer is yes, right? So on the left here is just an example of, of what, another one of these renderings where what you can see is that these green dots are all donor cells and we've replaced virtually all microglia with this single injection of cells right after birth. And so using that, we've then um, bred this mouse together with the, the mouse version of the Crab A disease that I just told you about, right? And what you can see is even in Crab A disease early in life, we can very quickly and efficiently introduce these surrogate cells into the brain. And the good thing about this model is that 
what we're doing by replacing these microglia is the mic the host microglia lack this this enzyme I told you about gal C, which which is what causes the disease. When we transplant in normal microglia, those microglia have gal C, and so in a way, this is this in and of itself may be a therapeutic intervention. And so the question is, how would we know that, and how would we start to think about that? And so that's what we're really working on now in my lab is understanding what this kind of a living drug where we're don't, introducing these cells into the brain that are replacing microglia, what does that do to the brain and what does it do in disease? And so I'm gonna show you just one example here. Uh, what we're looking at here is a, a piece, a section of a brain. So again, the blue is the nuclei of cells, which is where the, the DNA is in cells, right? And what we're standing for here instead of microglia is something called CD68. The name is less important than the idea that this is something that goes really, really high up in, in staining uh, when microglia are reactive or angry or sort of responding to damage in the environment. And so what you can see in a WT here means wild type, so a healthy mouse brain, is you get very little staining for this CD68, right? And, and it's typically in microglia, right? In this disease model that I told you about, you get this just flagrant overexpression of CD68 throughout the entire brain in all microglia, basically by the end stages of the disease. And, and that's what you would expect. The brain is getting damaged due to the toxin accumulation and then these microglia are reacting to that. When we transplant in these surrogate microglia that are normal into this model again here, uh, what we see is a dramatic reduction in the expression of CD68. And this is throughout the entire brain. And so the idea here is that by introducing these living drugs into this, this mouse model of a disease, we're really dramatically changing the brain. And this is the be just the beginning. This is sort of a teaser slide for what we're very actively pursuing right now, which is what do these living drugs do to the brain? How do we then take what we know and make, make these drugs even better? So I've got one more point here, which is I told you that microglia are distinct from monocytes and other cells that come from stem cells. So monocytes are the, the circulation correlate of macrophages in most tissues. Monocytes are in the circulation. They can enter into tissues, not typically the brain, but other tissues and fill it, right? So when we transplant in monocytes, they can fill the brain just fine. And they don't look, they're, they're everywhere, like I showed you in those previous slides. When we transplant in microglia, so when we take microglia out of one brain and put them into another, into the disease model here, this Crabbe disease model, we actually see a very different picture. And I wanna draw attention to two things, one, you can see these empty spaces in the brain where these cells have not filled it. And we don't know why that is, but we know we know it's true and we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to figure out if these are certain areas of the brain that they don't fill. But remember, mono, monocytes from the blood can turn into macrophages in the brain just fine and fill those areas. And the other thing is that these microglia change their morphology, their shape very dramatically. And that's what these arrows are pointing to. And so just to zoom in a little bit, these, these microglia, when we transplant them in, adopt a shape that we would call very, very reactive. They look like they're full maybe of the of these toxic lipids. Maybe they're trying to, to get rid of them. We don't know what's going on yet, but what we know is that microglia are, when we transplant them in, are responding very differently to the brain environment than monocytes. And this is another piece of the, what we're trying to work on to design these living drugs. And so hopefully, I think, I think I'm two minutes over my 15 minute goal, uh, but hopefully uh, I've taken you through a couple of things, right? We're very interested in the idea of replacing microglia as a way to treat diseases by introducing a living drug into the brain that lives there forever. Uh, hopefully, I was able to convey a little bit some of the hurdles that we face in this process. There's some precedent for doing this via a bone marrow transplant, but that's not exactly the right thing to be doing here. And so we're really trying to figure out better ways to do it that are safer and more specific to the brain. Uh, and we're using that to try to treat diseases, uh, as I described as as an example in crab A disease. Um, and so, I don't know, I think it would be fun for if you all could think of things. What could you do to a donor cell that you'd want to be in the brain that could help the brain, right? It's fun to brainstorm. So one example that I can think of is, what if you could make cells that you put in anti-inflammatory? What if you could genetically engineer them to stop inflammation? That might be good for certain diseases characterized by inflammation of the brain. Or what if you could program them to eat up the, the proteins that cause Alzheimer's disease, right? So those are some examples, but it would be fun to talk about more. And I just want to say thank you. i uh, really glad to be here. I really am fortunate to get to do this with my life. And I'm really grateful for my lab and my funders and for your all's attention and hopefully talk more. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Bennett, um, for your really informative talk. Uh, so we do have time for a few questions before YC comes in to introduce the next speaker.
So let's see, our most popular upvoted question right now is, what kinds of diseases could microglial treatment treat? And so you mentioned crab A. Um, yeah, uh, certainly. So we're choosing crab A disease because there's this precedent for treating it with a bone marrow transplant already, right? So I, I think that's one where it's likely to help, but you know, thinking big, I don't know, this is supposed to be a TED style talk, you know, the big thinking big, you know, I think we could use this in many contexts. I think the next step would be to try to use it in neurodegenerative diseases of aging, such as Alzheimer's disease, where we know that there's a certain kind of pathology in the brain and we might be able to engineer microglia to contain that pathology and prevent it from being damaging. So that would be an example. But then longer term, I mean, I don't know, the sky's the limit. As we get better and better at engineering cells, uh, there's a lot of things you could do. You could have conditional sort of microglia that when there's brain damage from a stroke, for example, secrete factors that help the brain heal better. Those are just some examples, but I think there's many. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question that was asked in the question and answer section is, is there an optimal time point during disease that you would want to intervene with microglia Ooh, I love that question. Uh, replacement? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things we're very fascinated by. So in the setting of Crab A disease, which is this very aggressive pediatric disease, we really want to just intervene as early as possible to stop the damage from accruing. But in other diseases, it's not entirely clear when you would want to intervene, right? It's probably a risk benefit analysis. First of all, if this is clinically feasible is the first step, obviously, I, I'd like to make it so. But then once it's so, you'd have to figure out when do you want to intervene, the risks of the transplant, the risk of the repla replacement balance with its therapeutic benefit. And I think that might depend on the disease. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Thank Bye. you. Um, we do have time for maybe two more questions. I love that's it. All right. So the next question, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, the next question that we have is for microglia replacement in humans, do you see this as something ingested, injected, oh. or implanted locally? The three possibilities are ingested, injected, or implanted locally. Um, I doubt ingested. That would be really yep. cool, though. Um, we are playing around with both of those possibilities. Um, I actually think that, uh, you know, delivering cells to the brain via the, the um, fluid around the spinal cord is actually not very invasive uh, and yet al allows safe access to the, what we call the CNS, the central nervous system. And that could be a way to deliver cells that could be directly injecting them, but having it be safe. I think we're very interested in understanding the signals that would call for cells from the blood to enter the brain. So what are the molecules that would mediate cells entering the brain? And if we could figure those out, we might be able to co-opt them such that we could do this by an injection. Uh, so those are the sort of my ideas, but it's still early days. All right, okay. Interesting. Right. Um, so, so would that be like a spinal the, tap? I, I, I wasn't sure how, how sort of blunt to be but yes i mean the idea is spinal taps are things that are done to for diagnostic reasons all the time to make sure someone doesn't have meningitis for example and they're done for example in an emergency room not not in an or right and so you might be able to use a similar approach but to deliver cells into the into the spinal uh, into the spinal fluid rather than taking fluid out okay thank you um and i think we have time for one more question so let's see uh, what functions could be lost or diminished by the potential decreases in number Ooh. of microglia surrogates? Um, I'm wondering if that's in part because I showed that we this figure with green dots where we weren't replacing all the microglia. And so what I think will happen is in those areas, there will likely still be the endogenous or the host microglia there. Uh, in other words, what, what happens is like I showed you with these depopulation and repopulation of the brain by microglia, I think the spaces where you don't have donor cells are likely to be filled with host cells. So, so there would not necessarily be an absence of microglia, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that's why we're very interested in building tools that are efficient at replacing microglia is for that very reason. We want to achieve maximal chimerism, so to speak, maximal replacement. All right. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Bennett. Um, Great. Thank you. We'll see you Great. again at the panel, at the Q&A panel.
So next up, YZ is going to return on screen and introduce our next speaker. <laughs> 